engineering and solar sciences at the University of Tennessee. And along with him will be Pat Kaiser, a uh, professor on the School of Natural Resources. And um, they're going to be looking at uh, a UT, uh, UT funded uh, program called the Smart Climate Grassland Project. And also along with some of the research, the regenerative drinking research that's being conducted out here at the Greenville Research Station. Dr. Forbes Walker, thank you for being with us. And Pat Kaiser, you as well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, as um, Mike mentioned, I'm a, a soil scientist. It's great to hear um, Alan Williams, an animal scientist, say how great the soils are. They finally figured it out. Um, I must admit, I, I was a bit slow in learning about soils as well. I, I was an agronomist working in Africa for about 10 years. It took me about 10 years to figure out, you know, you can have the best genetics in the world, but if you don't have the good soils, you can't uh, grow stuff. So I'm a slow learner as well. What we're going to talk about today is this uh, large um, grant that we received. When I talked to this group last year, we just heard that we'd been awarded the grant. Um, it's been a... Uh, interesting journey to get to where we are, but we've finally got all the paperwork in. Um, as with all these large grants, it's not just one person that's been involved with this. Pat Kaiser at the back there is the lead on this grant. He had black hair when we started this whole uh, process a couple of years ago. He's now gone white. Um, but this is our kind of core team that we've got listed here um, from the University of Tennessee. Uh, we've got Pat, who's a, uh, you know, a, 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 a native warm season grass guy, we've got a couple of economists, some soil scientists. Um, one discipline that we're actually missing from this group are our animal scientists from the University of Tennessee. It's been a challenge to try and get them to buy into this. They can tell us how to grow uh, tall fescue and how to uh, get rid of the weeds in tall fescue and how to grow hay and how to feed hay, but when it comes to something like this, it was a challenge to uh, get them um, to, uh, to join us. But uh, really what was going on here was beginning of last year, the USDA decided, okay, uh, we want to uh, fund up to, um, we actually ended up funding 70 large-scale pilot projects uh, looking at climate smart agriculture across the nation, um, different commodities, different things. So we focused ours on the, uh, the fescue belt, uh, we are the, 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 the buckle of the fescue belt, as it were, here in Tennessee, and uh, we are including states from um, the surrounding states. Um, so why are we interested in, in this in climate smart agriculture? We know, you know whether you believe in climate change or not. We know there's weirder weather. We're seeing more floods. We're seeing more droughts. We're seeing more intensive rainfall. We're seeing hotter periods. And... Uh, Every week there seems to be you know, something else going on on the, on, the, on the news if you watch it. This is a, um, a report that the EPA comes up with. This is the inventory of greenhouse gases. Um, Alan mentioned the, the main greenhouse gases we're looking at are CO2, uh, nitrous oxide, and methane. Uh, this report basically says, if you uh, look at the, uh, it's probably too small here to look at, but uh, agriculture is number four, about 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, behind transportation, electricity, and industry. So relatively small, but these other um, industries are changing. Uh, we know that transportation is changing with the advent of more electrical vehicles. Um, electricity and renewable energies is taking up more, and industry is paying attention to uh, a lot of this. So agriculture is only 10%, and uh, you can see by way, way in the large, the largest greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide at 80%. Uh, percent. Um, when we actually break it down into where are the emissions from agriculture coming, again, this is this same EPA report, uh, by far in a way the largest thing is the, top, uh, is the uh, bar on the, the top, soil management, so how we manage our soils. Every time we till our soils, we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, every, uh, you know, second thing is the enteric fermentation, so we know beef cattle um, emit a lot of methane in their uh, you know, they're, they're belching and they're, uh, they're uh, things, so that is a very large thing. A lot of bad press about how beef cattle are destroying the planet. I actually seriously believe that beef cattle are the solution to what we're talking about. Um, the people that are in the, the press saying cows are bad are basically looking at this one cow standing on a concrete pad. That cow does not stand on a concrete pad. 
I mean, here in Tennessee, we've got one cow for every couple of acres. So there's a lot of things, the way we manage that system across those two acres to get carbon into the soil and reduce some of these uh, things. So I believe, uh, so that is the, uh, the second bar was the entry uh, fermentation. Then we get down to manure management. And then we get down to these smaller things, rice cultivation, so that's flooded soils, urea fertilization, and liming. But the big top three there are soil management, manure management, and how, uh, and the emissions that come from cattle. Uh, regenerative ag and the livestock sector. I think we showed a, a version of this slide last year. Back in uh, 2020 and 2021, a number of the uh, large uh, livestock and protein industries basically came out with their uh, projected goals for uh, managing um, greenhouse gases and becoming carbon neutral. So you can see on the top there, uh, U.S. Dairy back in 2020 said they're going to be carbon neutral by uh, 2050. JBS Foods, which is the number one beef um, uh, entity uh, globally, said they're going to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. Tyson Foods, they all started, it was a bit of a uh, you know, I, I rushed to, we can outdo you. So Tyson Foods, net carbon zero by 2050. And then the Cattlemen's Association, carbon neutrality by 2040. So basically, this is what the industry is saying. These are our targets. Uh, those of us who are involved in science and research, this is, this is the challenge that we're up, we've been put in front of us. And I believe we can actually meet it. And uh, so this is why we, um, when Pat and I started talking about putting this proposal together, uh, said, okay, yes, we can do it. We uh, uh, got a big team together. So why grasslands and carbon? If we look at our footprint in the southeastern United States, by far the number one agricultural commodity is grass in the area. It's much higher than soybeans, much higher than corn. And uh, so uh, we've got some, um, this is a slide that Pat put together. 34% of the carbon stocks are in grasslands. Uh, temperate grasslands are far better than uh, temperate forests at sequestering carbon. Grasslands are more resilient than, than uh, forests. If you can just think about all the wildfires we've been having, it's the forests that are burning. Uh, the grasses, when they do burn, they recover much quicker than the forests. And they're also very responsive to management. And uh, again, this is a study. Grazing ruminants produce less greenhouse gases uh, than they sequester. This is a work out of Texas A&M. Alan mentioned that uh, and in one of his last slides. This is from uh, uh, Teague et al. in uh, 2016. So we know these things can do good jobs. So uh, as part of this crazy proposal we put together, uh, we included a number of the land-grant univer universities across uh, the southeastern United States. There's a big list of them. There's about 13 or 14 of them. University of Arkansas, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, um, Auburn, Clemson, Missouri, NC State, Purdue, uh, UT, Virginia State, Virginia Tech, Colorado State, and Maryland. So there's a lot of academics involved in this particular project. Uh, a number of conservation uh, folks are also involved, given the importance of grasslands and biodiversity, and we've already been more talking a lot about that. So the uh, you know, Tennessee Nature Conservancy, the monarch butterfly folks are involved with that. Industry, with a lot of industry partners, the, uh, the Tysons of the world, the JBS Foods, as well as others, you know, the Cortevas, which is the, the chemical industry folks, and uh, the, uh, the Farm Bureau, and the American Farm Bureau, as well as a number of beef and grassland organizations um, across the, uh, the, the country. The, the, uh, and then agencies, the Missouri Department of Conservation, our own Department of Agriculture, the Virginia Department of uh, Conservation and Recreation. So lots and lots of moving parts to this very, very large grant. This is the kind of footprint that we're seeing for the, the covering this grant. This uh, blue area here is a uh, outline of where the, the, the fescue belt is. We're right in the middle of the fescue belt, and these are the, 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 the different locations with the red dots are the different universities that are involved. So you can see all the different um, universities, all the way from uh, Indiana down to Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, etc. So what are we going to do with this particular uh, proposal, with this particular project? So USDA very much wanted us to put practices on the ground on real farms and then go ahead and start measuring what impacts it has on these greenhouse gases as well as carbon sequestration. So we're going to be working through our extension services 
extension agents in these states are going to be recruiting farmers. And the idea is to enroll 200, 230 or so farms to implement certain practices. And then we're going to go ahead and say, this is what the impact in this particular region of this particular practice. We're not going to say, out of these practices, you, you know, farmer A, you must do this practice. We're going to leave it to the choice of the farmers. Yes? We've had lots of discussions. We've got to follow lots of USDA you know, um, targets and things, but we're, we've identified the agents, so we know roughly which counties we're going to be working across this area. Then it's going to be a question of working with the agents to identify f farmers. There's a lot of rules that we've got to follow uh, with USDA stuff. So a lot of it's the, the uh, uh, less advantaged farmers and smaller farmers. and So we can... yeah. There's, that, that's still to be decided exactly. We haven't selected the farmers yet, but we're in the sta stages of determining how we're going to select those farmers. Um, so these are some of the practices that we're looking at. These are the top three practices that we think are going to get most buy-in. Uh, improved, or some would say regenerative grazing management, uh, different nitrogen fertilization strategies, using different alternative nitrogen fertilizers, as well as amendments to nitrogen fertilizers, as well as the native grass pastures. Pat Kaiser is our native grass specialist, and he's obviously uh, um, big behind that. I'm a big fan of these uh, native grasses. The um, other 30, and you can see the, uh, yeah, we got these graphs here. So obviously, the more um, ab above ground biomass we can get, the more below ground biomass we can get. It's all about um, and having healthy, productive forages. The other, um, Practices are native field borders. We're going to go into all these practices in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. Silver pasture, which is the integration of trees into the, uh, the grazing system, um, as well as some novel soil amendments, biochar and gypsum are two of the things that we are going to be focusing on. So these um, six farm practices will select based on the availability to increase carbon storage within the soil. Um, I'm a great fan of the uh, native... Uh, warm season grasses because of the, the deeper root system that we've got. Uh, as a soil scientist, I'm a bit, little bit embarrassed to say that historically we have sampled in the top six inches of the soils to look at the soil chemistry to come up with recommendations for fertilizer stuff. That's the way uh, soil chemistry and soil testing originally uh, developed. We really haven't, don't know how much is going on below the ground, although there's more and more work being done in this area. But I think the deeper the rooting system, the greater the potential for carbon sequestration, the greater the potential to reverse some of these things um, that we're, we're hearing about in, in climate um, uh, science. Um, so the, it boils down to the roots. Um, so the, while we're managing, obviously, the forage for the animals, we're also wanting to make sure we've got a good deep rooting system. And I think this picture here shows, you know, if you clip the... Uh, the roots um, or the, the above bi biomass down um, close to the ground, you've got very poor root systems. If you let it grow, you've got a very strong, robust root system. So grazing and grazing management is really, really important, and it boils down to the roots. Um, I remember as a graduate student at North Carolina State, I took a class in roots, and I took from that class was never, ever work with roots. They're really complicated. But, uh, 25 years later, what am I doing? We're focusing on roots. Anyway, uh, slow learner, I guess. So um, we're also, the, um, these practices were selected on trying to reduce the in inputs. The fewer the inputs we're going to put in, especially things like nitrogen, uh, the fewer the greenhouse gas emissions that we're going to have. Improve resilience to more extreme weather conditions. So we know across the region we're getting more floods, we're seeing more droughts, we're seeing more warming conditions. Uh, how do we um, build resilience into the system? We build resilience into the soils. If we've got resilient soils, we can handle many of these things. The con contribution um, of, to productive grassland farming. None of these practices are going to really work if it doesn't make money uh, for farmers and improve, you know, improve, improve pr production or the quality of the production. So that's a real uh, important thing. Uh, obviously, profitability and... Oops, pressed the wrong one. And uh, some track record familiarities. So we, we have got some um, experience with some of these things. 
and we do know that these are likely to succeed. So the idea is to try and come up with a win-win situation for the farmer, a win-win situation uh, for the, uh, the, the marketing, the profitability, win-win situation for the soils and for the, uh, in the climate in general. So these are the practices that we're going to be talking about. Again, the top three we think are going to get the most buy-in, the, uh, the, the grazing management, the improved nitrogen fertility, and the native grass pastures, and as well as these other ones we're going to briefly talk about. But again, we're not going to be telling farmers, you must select all of these practices. You must specifically select these practices. These are the practices that the farmers uh, are going to be uh, focusing on. Um, end goal is we want a vigorous, diverse, productive, profitable, resilient pasture. Uh, a bit like the, uh, the picture there in the, uh, on the right. So improving grazing management. So maintaining good canopy. Basically what we're talking about when we're talking about grazing management is uh, we need to have some level of grazing, but we do not want to overgraze. So we need to have practices where we're going to be uh, uh, increasing the health of the pasture, uh, how vigorous the stand is, as well as producing this high volume of uh, root systems. A lot of terminology out there. Uh, we're obviously the regenerative summit here, so regenerative is one of the terms. Uh, Alan mentioned uh, adaptive uh, multi paddock, that's what the Texas AM folks at Vernon, Texas, they've published on this. Sustainable, these are all terms that are used out there and all the, the, the types of things that we're going to be working on. Whatever we call it, it comes down to we don't want to see overgrazing. These, past, these grasses, uh, many of these grasses co evolved with the animals, so we don't want to not graze. They don't perform as well if they're not grazed. They have to be grazed, but they have to be grazed in, the, in a level that's appropriate and that does not uh, result in overgrazing. Uh, moderately grazed grasslands produce larger root volumes than those that are lightly grazed or overgrazed. So this is, and again, why we want that? So we want more roots. We want more roots because that's where we're going to get the carbon sequestration as well as the other benefits of improving the resilience of the soil system. Improved nitrogen fertilization. We know that nitrogen... If you apply nitrogen to a, a grazing system, you're really going to increase yields. That's, that's a well-known fact. Uh, we don't want to oversupply this nitrogen. A, that's an economic problem, but it's also an environmental, and now uh, the, the potential to increase the, uh, the production of nitrous oxide is really, really high. So we want to get a greater plant vigor with the judicious use of nitrogen, leading to greater root volumes. Uh, Again, we want these, these grasses to be grazed at moderate levels. We don't want to overgraze them. Uh, we want to avoid a negative impact on soil, soil biota. We know whenever we apply commercial nitrogen fertilizers or other nitrogen fertilizers, we're going to have some amount of nitrous oxide uh, emitted from the soil. It's emitted in very low concentrations. The big thing with, the, uh, with nitrous oxide is in terms of uh, greenhouse gas, it's three, almost three hundred times uh, uh, this uh, impact of something like CO2. So nitrous oxide, very, very small quantities, but very, very large impact. Uh, predominant source of commercial fertilizers we're using is urea. Uh, we've had seen a big shift in, in nitrogen fertilizers in the last 10 years here in Tennessee. We used to be all ammonium nitrate. We're now all, ammonia, we're now all urea. We know we, in the urea systems, we lose a lot of, um, of nitrogen with volatilization. A uh, lot of energy goes into producing urea, so we've got to pay attention to using these things much more efficiently and uh, much more judiciously uh, and of, you know, making sure that we are, are uh, using our resources effectively. There are lots of organic sources, and already in Tennessee and elsewhere in the southeast, a lot of organic fertilizers are being used. We're thinking of things like poultry litter, biosolids are common things. So we want to compare the use of those things with commercial fertilizers and what does that do in terms of productivity as well as uh, greenhouse gas production. Uh, so these are some of the things that we're going to be looking at. Urea with and without different nitrogen stabilizers, these urease inhibitors that slow the, the, uh, the, the, the breakdown of urea into ammonium and then into nitrate, and the nitrification inhibitors. Where we have access to po uh, poultry litter, great source of nitrogen, and uh, we're going to be looking at that. Some interceding with legumes is another potential source, as well as the use of biosolids, which is available in some parts, depending on where you are. Native grass pastures. This is really Pat's area. Uh, Pat's done a lot of work uh, to uh, show you know, the benefits of, of native pastures 
in terms of animal performance, but uh, uh, what we're doing is we're improving the plant diversity. We've already mentioned the importance of diversity. The more diversity will bring in more diversity and greater pasture resilience. Uh, we know that these natives produce uh, higher root volumes uh, compared with the cool season grasses. Uh, we know they're great for f uh, f f drought and flood and heat tolerance. Uh, short anecdote, back in, uh, was it 2017, Pat and I were in Middle Tennessee after Hurricane Harvey uh, was, had passed through Middle Tennessee. Hurricane Harvey had sat on um, over Houston and dropped 50 or 60 inches of rain in a two-week period, inundated the whole city of Houston. It went through Middle Tennessee. Depending who you spoke to, we had about this much rain in a 24-hour period. Uh, again, I've mentioned I'm a slow learner. I'll, I, I'll I illustrate my point. We went onto this farm where it was a, they had a combination of cool season pastures, primarily um, uh, tall fescue, as well as natives. The cool season pastures were all flooded. They were underwater. We were driving on the native warm season pastures, and they'd had about this much rain in a 24-hour period. So when we talk about infiltration, and Alan has mentioned that, phenomenal amounts of infiltration rates with these things. And this is, this is not only good for the, 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 the soil, but it's also good for that so much less runoff. We're not going to be inundating our urban centers. We're not going to have to redesign our urban infrastructure because we're not going to have all these floods. So we can get more and more of these types of systems on the landscape, uh, not only benefiting the animals and benefiting um, the, 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 uh, the the, the soils, but also reducing the potential for these floods is going to be uh, amazing. So that's uh, my improved diversity. And there's just an, an ex example here illustrating the rooting depth. This is uh, poor old turf lawn grass here with their rooting depth compared with the root. Again, it's all about the roots uh, with these type of systems that we're going to be focusing on. Um, I've already mentioned this. We also, the other thing is because they're natives, they require much fewer inputs. Uh, they don't really respond to lime, so we don't need to add lime. Uh, they, because of the rooting depth, we don't need to, they don't respond to a lot of our traditional nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And if we're not putting these things onto the soil, we're then not going to be potentially increasing the, the greenhouse gas production in, um, for, the, um, um, for, for the, the nitrous oxide. And obviously less resilience on hay. Um, those of you who do, you know, who grow these native grasses know the biomass you get in the summer. It's just a phenomenal uh, quantity of biomass. And you're obviously, the less you have to, you know, the, the more you can feed on pastures and the less you, you, can, you need to feed on hay, great um, for the animals, but also, again, this greenhouse gas footprint and the costs. And Pat will go into the costs a little bit. The other thing is the benefit at risk to wildlife populations. Pat mentions quail here. Uh, we have a number of examples of there's a, a farm we've been working with recently that we put in a four species of native warm season grass. And with those um, establishment of these grasses, birds would come in from other areas. And after two or three years, we've not just got four of these native grasses. We've, we think we've got double that amount or even more. You know, birds are coming in. They're bringing seeds with it. So we're increasing the diversity, we increase the diversity, the, uh, the bird populations, the butterfly populations, the other uh, critters that, that like to live in these areas. Silver pasture, I'm almost at the end of my thing and Pat will be coming up, is the integration of trees into uh, grazing systems. Uh, well, I'm not going to show this, but there's a lot of data to show there that you know, animals obviously, you, you know, why do you need trees in a pasture, there's a great potential to uh, increase the carbon sequestration because you've got all that woody biomass being produced. Uh, obviously, a great way for animal welfare, pr providing shade, these warmer uh, summers, you know, more 100-degree uh, days, these animals need to maintain their condition and they got to uh, um, um, you know, ha have shade. Um, other potential for um, al alternative revenue streams, whether it be wood and fiber, or trees and nuts. I know some people are growing chestnuts and other uh, nut crops in their, in, their in their pastures and getting an alternative uh, revenue stream from there. And there's obviously the wildlife and the biodiversity. Perennial grassland buffers. This is, uh, again, we're talking mainly on the, uh, this, while this doesn't really fit, it's mainly for the buffers for crop field edges. 
we believe there are some cases on these um, mixed operation farms where we've got cattle and row crops that this will be a, a, a thing that can, people can take advantage of. Obviously, large increase of the, uh, of the soil organic carbon uh, compared with a, a single species system. Ha again, habitat for you know, birds, pollinators, other critters, and improve the uh, habitat for at-risk grassland birds, uh, contribute to improve water quality, and reduce the movements off-site of nutrients and other potential pesticides and soil erosion. Last part before I hand over to Pat, the use of so level soil amendments, uh, specifically looking at biochar and gypsum. I talked briefly about biochar last year. And we've been doing some work on biochar across Tennessee for the last 10 years. There's a lot of interest in it. I know what doesn't work. I'm starting to understand what does work. But I see that this has got a great potential to increase sequestration rates, especially when you combine it uh, with these deeper-rooted perennial grassland systems. So you may not see an immediate impact with biochar, uh, but it might be akin to planting a, a tree seedling. You're, not, you're planting that tree seedling, you're not going to harvest it for 10 or 15 years. Put the biochar down now today, and then in maybe 10 or 15 years, you've got carbon, which we can measure at these deeper roots, and then poten uh, potentially um, market it on the, uh, the carbon markets. So one of the things with these amendments is to um, evaluate the effects on forage quality and quantity, uh, how much carbon sequestration we get, and how we mitigate the greenhouse gases. I will mention we do know that the uh, use of biochar also slows down the conversion of nitrogen. And so we do know there's, there's, uh, from the, the, the scientific literature that, that biochar does have an impact on reducing nitrous oxide. So what exactly is biochar? It's this charcoal-like material. You take a, a, a woody biomass, you heat it up in the absence of oxygen. Uh, mostly, usually it's from renewable energy things. So what they do is they are generating syngases, gases like hydrogen that they collect and then use uh, to put through a hydrogen cell to generate power. But we're basically left with this highly porous... Um, oh dear. Uh, uh, yeah. We're left with a, a highly porous, stable, carbon-rich material. This is a an example of some wood chips that before and then after pyrolysis, this heating in the absence of oxygen, you end up with this biochar. Uh, we know that the addition of biochar, and it depends on what type of biochar you have, will change the soil chemical and physical properties. We see an increase in the cation exchange capacity, our inability of the soil to hold plant nutrients. Uh, some of these things have got very large surface areas, so the ability to hold a lot of moisture and increase moisture holding capacity is really important. Uh, we can, in some cases, modify the pH, and sometimes uh, they are a source of nutrients like phosphorus and potassium. Uh, this is a paper that came out in 2020, work in Iowa, where they put biochar on a native warm season grass. Uh, long story short, they initially, back in 2011, put 7.2 tons per hectare of carbon in biochar on this particular um, native grass. They came back six years later, and they found in the biochar plots there was almost 15 tons. So in six years, they had doubled the carbon sequestration rates uh, compared with the no biochar. So we know in these kind of systems, this has the potential to increase sequestration. What's happening is the biochar is moving through the soil profile. It's forming these little micro environments for the microbes to work and doing all sorts of things. And that's where we're getting the sequestration. So what is gypsum? You can get it from either from mined or recycled drywall. Um, or byproduct from cold fired plants. What is it? It's calcium sulfate. It's been used as a soil conditioner for a long time, mainly in row crop systems. Uh, we know it will alleviate aluminum toxicity in soils. It also supply calcium and sulfur. Uh, it's used for treating sodic soils, so soils with a high salt content. Um, the peanut folks down in Georgia use it because it assists in the pegging and reduces uh, the end blossom rot. We have a lot of gypsum in our part of the world. We're in the Tennessee Valley. We have one and a half million tons produced by TVA every year. A lot of that stuff is going to produce drywall or it's going straight into the landfill. Similar story south of here, the southern company down in Alabama and Georgia, they have similar quantities. So we know gypsum works. Why have we included it in this project? This is one of these crazy things that uh, people like myself will say, well, there's a study out of Brazil 
where they applied gypsum, calcium sulfate, on a sugarcane. So sugarcane is effectively a perennial grass. Uh, it's a ratoon crop. You harvest it six or seven times before you then have to replant. But they put it down at about two tons to the acre. Uh, what they found after uh, six years or so, an 80% increase in the carbon sequestered at 40 to 100 centimeters. So you're putting down calcium sulfate, and we're finding great potential increases in the sequestration of, of carbon. It works in the tropics. Why doesn't it, can't it work here? This is something that we're going to, it's a readily available, this material, so that's another reason for including it. So I'm going to hand over now to Pat, before Pat comes over and steals my, uh, my, my microphone. Again, this, imp this whole project's all about m improving grassland stewardship, more grass for uh, lower feed costs, more grass for greater returns, more grass for healthier pastures and soil, more grass for a better buffer against drought, and obviously, we're looking to the future, the potential for access to carbon markets. Are you okay? Am I on? Yeah. There I'm you go. On. All I really need to steal is that from you. Okay. Uh, before you go, Forbes, uh, questions. I, I'm, I'm guessing, just a wild guess, that the oxygen level in y'all's brains has gone down because we've all been up here preaching for a while, right? So instead of me starting to preach now to a bunch of people who are asleep, I don't want y'all really to be asleep, not now. You do that tonight. L let's take a, just a short break, not get out of your seat break, unless you want to get up and do jumping jacks. We approve of that uh, to get the oxygen moving again. But before I dive in, questions for either one of us, but particularly Forbes on, on the preaching he just did. And Pat, you need to be on the stage here do, because, do I have to because be you there? are being recorded and it's going to be put hey, all over the uh, internet. How many people here have ever watched uh. the news? <laughs> have you seen that dude that keeps falling down? If I get up there, I'm going to be on my face, y'all. <laughs> I'm going to try to play nice to get recorded. So, the, I mean, the gypsum is available. You know, TVA has it. We finally got it on the books. It's taken forever to get the uh, TVA to actually agree to land apply it. They were, you know, hiding behind a bunch of rules. But there are some uh, consultants out there. We were working with a group out of Indiana that actually has a, a, a gypsum spreading business. So uh, we still haven't worked out the details, but it is available uh, you know, through TVA. And you know, if we want to talk, I can, we, we, I can put you in touch with people to talk to, and I think we can get some gypsum. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it should be readily available and relatively inexpensive. Yes, Russ? Biochar. Biochar, yes. Right. And as I said earlier today, very labor intensive. If you found a way of being able to make great quantities with reduced labor. So what Russ is talking about is how we make biochar. I was talking, you know, he makes it in a, basically in a, a 55 gallon drum with a 35 gallon drum in it. It's very intensive. So yes, that is a very intensive way. I can talk, there are some other smaller scale systems. They're almost like it dumpsters that you can make it in. Um, there's a, a woman called, um, she's out of Oregon, but uh, Kelpie, some or other, but, but she has these systems. There are also, under the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a lot of uh, bioenergy systems being promoted. And we in Tennessee are starting to see a lot of these companies that are going to be producing a, uh, they're producing a biodiesel from uh, biomass, and the byproduct is going to be biochar. So, these things are starting to uh, emerge all over the place. I'm not, you know, in Pennsylvania, I'm not sure where you have, but I'm sure there's going to be some um, local things. And, you know, we, we, can cont we can discuss by email, and I'll see what I can find out for your area. But there are going to be these commercial things. The other thing is NRCS is using biochar as a way of increasing soil carbon, and there are some dollars. I don't know if you work with NRCS, but there are some equip dollars, e e environmental quality incentive uh, program uh, where they've got some quite nice cost share that they would pay you to buy biochar to put it on your soil. So I can see, I don't know if Pennsylvania has signed in on it, but those are things, but we can, we can talk and I can help you find out where to find that information. But um, yes. Yeah, pl 
I mean, plowing does. So we are, we are not, obviously, in this, we don't have a plowing treatment because we're obviously not plowing our pastures um, in our grazing system. But uh, yes, um, it, Pat's going to be covering some of the research things that we're going to explain how we're going to compare some of these different practices. But farm, we're rather than saying plowing compared with other things, we're going to be saying farmer practice. This is what you're currently doing. You know, it may be uh, fescue, you know, fertilized, you know, with urea, um, continuously grazed. That's going to be your practice. We're going to compare it with some of these other practices and see what differences and benefits we can, we can see in productivity as well as in the greenhouse gas and the carbon sequestration stuff. Do you char fertilize your We, I have not done, and I've done a lot of work with biochar, but I just typically use straight biochar. But yes, you can do that. And I'm, I'm yet to be convinced that it does anything, but um, yes. <laughs> So the biosolids, biosolids, but basically, we, we, you know, they're, they're processed, uh, you know, residuals from wastewater treatment. There are different classes of biosolids, class A, class B, and as ex exceptional quality. There's a lot of rules and regulations. You're right. There's a lot of testing that goes into the, the use of these biosolids. A generation ago, biosolids was nasty. Now, more and more of these wastewater treatment plants have really got um, a handle on where the, the, the problems are. And those industries that are discharging nasty stuff into our sewage systems are no longer doing that. So yes, are there still some bad biosolids? Yes, there are. Um, and so we're not going to be suggesting using these Class B biosolids. This we're going to be using Class A biosolids with good chemical analysis, so we know what's actually in there. So I've, yeah, that's another area. Your, your point is well taken. It's yeah, it's all over the place. But if we know what's in there, then we, we can we can do a, a good job in advising. So I'm not going to. Labor the point and let Pat carry on. And, um, okay, I'm slowly destroying my microphone here, but I think got, we're going to make it. All right. Forbes, thank you thank so you. much. And again, as Forbes said, this is kind of a team of us that put all this together, and Forbes has obviously been a real uh, critical part of that. And, you know, just to kind of summarize a lot of what, what he's talked about already is grasslands are a heck of a carbon sink. They're the best carbon sink on the planet. And for those of you all that are in the regenerative grazing business or the grazing business at all, I think we are the heroes of this story. If there's going to be major gains in agriculture in terms of carbon sequestration and reduction in greenhouse gas footprints, I think it's going to come through grazing. And these practices that Forbes has, has lined out for you really are what, when you look at the science that's out there around grasslands agriculture, these are the things that are going to contribute to this win. These are the things that are going to produce more roots. Because, you know, we, we're calling this, uh, you may have noticed up here, a grasslands partnership. We really ought to call this the roots partnership. Because everything that contributes to improve soil health really starts with roots, whether it's the organic matter, the water infiltration, the wet aggregate stability, the biosphere where all those organisms live, all those exudates in that root zone, that's where the action is. And if you want soil health, what you really mean is you want roots. And the way to get to roots, this group above anybody else ought to know, is your grazing management and a lot of the other things that, that Forbes has just finished explaining to you. So. There is a lot of talk out there that we're going to have a carbon economy. Is it going to happen? I don't know. Pundits tell you one thing, another pundit will tell you another thing, but clearly there is an interest in it. And Forbes, he showed you that, all these industries lining up behind it. Um, so the point is this, is if this marketplace emerges, uh, Dr. Williams stood up here and told you that you got a marketing opportunity based on, on quality of the food and the quality of the health of the environment. Well, there could be a marketing opportunity out there that farmers can cash in on and make their operations more profitable if this marketplace emerges. So if we can get all of this done and improve our soils, our farms, and our environment, we feel like the farmer wins, the potential of grass to impact our environment in the future is, is realized, 
and we wind up getting those benefits back to us in terms of quality uh, food products and a healthier environment in terms of, for instance, things like quail and pollinators. So we think this is a path that is really valuable and what I'm gonna talk about to start with is the fact that even if it does none of the things that we just talked about, let me show you some of the things we know that it does. So, I'm a researcher. I, I, I create experiments, study stuff, gather data till you can't stand it anymore. We analyze it and we publish it. That's what we're in the business of doing, okay? I'm proud of the research we do. I stand behind the research we do and I think it's quality research. But you know, there's a time to leave the experiment station there's time to leave the greenhouse, there's time to leave the laboratory and head to the farm. What you see right here is National Cattle and Beef Association, a project they had several years back. This is data from 475 herds over 15 years. Folks, it does not get any more real world than that, okay? So they took all these benchmark data points and they, the, the ag economists, God bless them, sat down and pencil whipped this and they tried to identify factors that influence the profitability of a beef operation. Now, of all the people on the planet, I'm going to ask y'all, and, and you can read, so maybe you already see what the answer is. What's the answer? Grass, right? So this is how many acres are allotted per cow. The people that are overstocked, not very many acres per cow, aren't making money. In fact, they're losing money. The people who are understocked, who have ample grass, Lots of grass, and part of the secret to this is, anybody ever heard of something called a drought? Forbes talked about that, right? We're getting some nasty droughts. We get floods. We get these ups and downs in forage production, and here in the fescue belt, every summer we have sort of a little bit of a forage drought, right? Because our cool season grasses give out a little bit. So the point is this, is if you have lots of grass, you get through the tight spots and you're not out feeding hay, you're not purchasing commodity feeds, you're not finding other feeds, you're not selling cattle into an oversupplied uh, uh, market because everybody else is trying to bail, right? So the point is grass is the key to profitability. Now, one of the dirty secrets about this right here is that data, these 475 herds were based in Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico the Southern Plains, and you think, well, crap, Kaiser, what that's got to do with us? This is East Tennessee, or some of y'all from Virginia, Pennsylvania, Missouri, wherever. What's that got to do with us? Let me show you something. Iowa State did the exact same thing with the exact same data, but from their part of the country. So Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, very, very different than Texas and New Mexico, right? I don't have to explain that one. What did they find out separated the, forgive me, the men from the boys, the profitable from the people losing money? Feed. 57% of the difference in the profitability of operations in the upper Midwest was based on their feed costs. In other words, you got grass, you have low feed costs. You don't have grass, you have high feed costs, right? And by the way, the next biggest thing they could find that determined profitability was way down at 9%, and that was depreciation. So that tractor, that hay mower, what have you, right? So what it comes down to is we know that grass is the key to profitability. Let me show you one other example of this that might drive this home. This is uh, from Ed Rayburn, recently retired forage extension specialist up in West Virginia. So here is gross income for uh, the number of head per 90 acres. He, he had a 90 acre farm and he wanted to demonstrate it on a relatively small scale. I know there's folks out there that got 1,000 acres, but there's an awful lot of farms in the fescue belt that are very small. So what happens when you have 20 head, you're grossing about 18,000. As you go up to 40 head, you're up to grossing 27,000. Easy decision, I'm putting 40 head out there, right? Right? Wrong, because you can't spend gross income. You know what you can spend? Net income, right? So what happens when you go from 20 to 40 head? Your feed costs go up, right? So you are making less money. Look, look at this, the guy with 40 head on there is making less money than somebody with 20 head, right? So if you wanna make money, you need to be properly stocked, which in this case would be about 25 head on those uh, 90 acres. That's where you're gonna have the most money in your pocket to do whatever it is you need to do. Send a kid to college, pay for a new pickup truck, re replace a tractor, whatever the heck it is, that's where that income comes from. You can spend net income.
All right? So here's, here's the point of all this, is that good grass management is good business. Okay? And bad grass management is bad business. Okay? So you're way up here, you're not making much money. And that's been shown all kinds of different examples. We can show it many different ways. But what we're talking about with this whole project is good grass management because not only is it profitable, but it also helps with all these other outcomes we're looking for, right? So, uh, for instance, drought. I mentioned drought. You have a bad drought. You run out of grass. What do you do? There's not much grazing left in that pasture, y'all. And everybody here, if you're in the fescue belt, has seen a pasture that looks like that. Nice fescue pasture. Probably looked pretty good back in April and May. Not so much. Same day, same drought, same county. That's what a warm season grass can do for you. Blue stem, in this case, right? So, again, having grass has benefits. Forbes has already talked about roots. Many of you have seen that picture off the interwebs. But that is the key to soil health. I've already mentioned that. That's where all the good things happen is in that great big root mass. In this case, that's native grass plants, and that's part of the reason we are excited about native grass plants. That's a whole lot of root mass. Uh, more native grass plants, this is from the Dust Bowl, an old picture from the early 30s. The plow plowed all that prairie, but for whatever reason, maybe the guy was answering his cell phone, right? Y'all with me? Okay, thank you. So, some of y'all got it, right? So he, he, he jerked the wheel over and missed that little clump there. Look what that blue stem plant did. That's called soil health, y'all. That's like keeping the soil where it belongs. Roots matter. Uh, again, why the profitability of having more grass? Uh, well, one of the reasons is less input, right? And so here, here's a switchgrass pasture. Been there for 21 years old the day that picture was taken. All this fella has done in those 21 years, never fertilized, never sprayed, practices rotational grazing, and occasionally he will burn it off in the spring. That's low input. He's not spending money. He's grazing cattle, okay? Um, from all the grazing studies we've done on our native grasses, one of the things they do is they give us very cheap gain for the reasons I just showed you. There are additional reasons, high yield, but also uh, high rates of gain. So you multiply stocking times rates of gain, uh, and you wind up, and low input, you wind up with pretty daggone cheap beef. And if you look all over the country at data on cost of gain, people come to me and say, I got such and such gain. That's great. I'm all for high rates of gain. Important for grass finishing, right? But the problem is, it, what are you paying for it? That's that difference between net income and gross income and cost of doing business. And so here we got some really cheap rates of gain, and if you look across the board at every kind of feed stuff, every kind of study done on forages or any other feed stuff for cattle, that's about the floor, what you're seeing right here. It doesn't get much better than that. And of course, it comes down to cheap pastures. We've already talked about that. That example I showed you, the switchgrass, the guy hasn't done much to it in 21 years. Well, the reason we have high net returns per acre is because we're not spending money. We have high carrying capacity and high rates of gain. Tall fescue, in our part of the world, especially the way things have been going climate-wise, we kind of need to prop fescue up. It needs reasonable fertility. It needs reasonable moisture. And so we've got to take care of it. And Bermuda grass, even though we can produce the heck out of forage with Bermuda grass, to do so requires some fairly massive inputs of nitrogen and potash. And so, again, your net return uh, or your, in this case, your pasture cost goes up and your net return goes down. So the point of all this is good grass management is good business. It's a great way to go. It keeps the farm a farm. It keeps you having positive cash flow. And we think it can be an important factor in the whole carbon game. So one of the things that we wonder about when you decide to implement some of the practices that Forbes shared with you, where is the payoff? When, when do you hit that point of diminishing returns? And more importantly, when do you start to see any return at all? So this is just a hypothetical graph here. So what if you have really poor management, and here's excellent management, and here's these outcomes. Now, those outcomes might be reduced greenhouse gases. They might be improved wildlife habitat. There might be more pounds of beef per acre. They might be higher net returns to the operation, right? Well, where, where does that sweet spot hit? 
do you have to go way across here and become a, a supreme grass manager before you see the payoff? Do you have to get way over to the right side of the chart before it pays off? Maybe. Or is it one of those deals where each step that you make towards improved management gives you a proportional increase in outcomes? Is it kind of a one-to-one -one ratio? Possibly. Or do you get most of your payoff early? Once you come up out of the ditch, so to speak, when you get out of the bad management, you kind of hit this leveling off, this plateau, where things don't get much better. Well, we've all got opinions, and we can form opinions on that right there. I've got some myself, but what I can tell you is, in this carbon marketplace that's threatening to emerge, if, if for instance, we just boil this down to nothing but carbon right here, where does that carbon payoff come? The problem, markets hate risk, okay? Markets do not like risk. If you think someone's gonna come invest in something that they consider very risky, very unlikely to succeed, bank's gonna say, thanks for stopping by, see you later, right? And it's not just banks, it's everybody out there who's got money to invest avoids risk, right? So um, what they wanna know is, how much carbon do you have reliably? Not my opinion, not your opinion, not some wild guess, but how much carbon is under that acre? And how is it influenced by management? And how stable is that over time? That's what the marketplace needs to know, and that's an important part of what we're trying to accomplish. So, how do we do that? If I came to you, has anybody here ever been to a doctor? Help, help me, y'all. <laughs> Everybody here has been to a doctor. Has anybody here been to a doctor when they said, hey, you have got to fill in the blank, right? Lose weight, stop eating so much of this, stop smoking so much of that, right? Sooner or later, maybe you've had that encounter, or maybe it's just old guys like Greg. I'm not as old as Greg, by the way. Actually, I might be. I don't know. He might have been able to retire early. But if, if that doctor says, go get on a diet, You've got to reduce your cholesterol. You've got to reduce your blood sugar. You've got to reduce your weight. How are we going to know if the diet works? You're going to step on the scales, right? You're going to measure something. You're going to see progress. So if we want to do something with soils, particularly in the arena of carbon, and by the way, uh, Forbes and I were chatting on the way up here from Knoxville. The Soil Health Institute, did I call it by the right name, Forbes? Uh, had a $20 million grant from USDA to study measures of soil health, I guess. What they came up with is three measures, and Forbes, keep me honest here, I might go off the rails. Uh, wet aggregate stability, how, how aggregated the soil is, so it's not just a pile of dust, it's clumps, it's chunky, right? Uh, bulk density, right, so how packed in tight it is or not. So if you've got high aggregate stability and low bulk density, water can get through, there's air uh, space in there. And finally, uh, the last one, Forbes, was uh, soil organic carbon, right? If you think about that, soil organic carbon kind of drives the other two. You could argue that soil organic carbon, AKA organic matter in your soil, drives the train, okay? And so almost no matter what you're interested in about soils, if you could just measure one thing, I would argue that probably measuring soil organic carbon is, is really where the money is. And that's where the marketplace is threatening to emerge, so we have to measure it. So what are we gonna do? Forbes told you that we're gonna try to identify 100 farms across these nine states as a large-scale pilot project where we're gonna compare business as usual, which will vary farm by farm, to improved practices, practices that are designed to produce more vigorous stands of grass with bigger root systems, right? Whether it's nitrogen, grazing management, natives, what have you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the heck out of this. How are we gonna do that? Our, our soil carbon specialist, Dr. Sindhu Jagadama, uh, starting in year one, which will be 2024, we're gonna go out and measure soil. We're gonna take uh, 36 inch cores, so Forbes said, you know, traditionally we've gone down there and we've measured six inches. We're going down a meter. We're going down 36 inches with a hydraulic probe to find the soil carbon levels in four different strata all down through that soil column. We're going to do it again in year five to see what kind of improvement we've seen over time. And we're also going to do an in interim, 
check at year three, but again, just at too shallower strata to try to see what that trajectory looks like, right? And here's the fun part about all this. We're only going to do about 50,000 samples. Anybody want to come help? This is going to be one of the largest soil carbon data sets anywhere. And one of the things USDA wanted out of this project is a good understanding of what the heck is going on with soil carbon. And I think at the end of this project, we're going to have farms that do a really good job of implementing these practices. We're going to have farms that do terrible jobs of implementing these practices. We're going to have farms that start at a very reasonable level of soil health. We're going to have farms that start off, remember my curve over here to the left side? Maybe they're horrible managers. We're not excluding horrible managers from this study. We want some horrible managers in there. We want some really good managers, and we want those in between. Because what we want to see is what the heck happens to our soil carbon, our soil health, and everything associated with it. Uh, you heard Dr. Williams earlier talking about stacking things, right? So we're going to measure the heck out of stuff. We're going to measure that carbon a meter deep. We're also going to measure vegetation and right on up the line. And so th this is going to give us the ability, and I mentioned these three key metrics, right, bulk density, SOC, and uh, then we're going to be able to convert that to a per, uh, that says meg megagrams per hectare. In, in science world, we need to talk about these metric uh, systems, but, but uh, tons per acre, right? And so that's what we're going to measure and see what's going on there. Now, that is an extensive sampling effort. We're also going to do an intensive sampling effort. And the cool thing for y'all, at least for me and Russ, where you at, Russ? Is he, is he with me? He is with me, daggone it, right to the bitter end. I love it. So we're going to do this right here in Greenville, Tennessee, at a research station. And what we're going to do is we have set up an experiment here with uh, yeah, 16, 18 pastures. I, heck, I should know, but I, I forget the exact number. They're each five acres, and, and an awful lot of the grazing research that's been done through the decades has been done on three to five acre pastures. So we're real comfortable with that size frame. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at three measures of sort of improved grazing management. Maybe you want to call it regenerative. It may not be the, in the purest sense regenerative, but we're going to get at some important details about how we manage grazing. And because of this scale, right, so that's about 100 acres over here at Greenville. Some of you all familiar with the station may even know where that's at. But we're going to be able to do much more intensive sampling at this site. Uh, than we could on those 100 farms, right? And so what are we going to do there? Well, we're, first of all, we're going to look at two different forage bases. Forbes showed you a slide that said more diversity is good, right? We've heard that from all sorts of sources. Uh, so what we're going to do is, again, the, the whole premise behind this, everything we're doing is business as usual versus improved. Reasonable improvements that we can expect the average farm operator can adopt and succeed at, right? So. We're going to start off with hot fescue as our control. That's, that's the business as usual. Now, BMPs will tell you that if you've got hot fescue, you need clover in there. So this is really tall, tall fescue, hot fescue with uh, clovers. And we're going to compare that to a diverse native pasture with multiple species, including forbs. And forbs, the forbs with an E, right, not the forbs without an E, shows you that slide with all those pretty roots. Prairie soils, right? Lots of, and by the way, I don't know if you all know this, but much of the eastern United States, including where we are sitting right here today, if you go back to 1491, was probably a mix of blue stem pastures with lots of oaks and hickories and some pines scattered through there. In other words, a silvo pasture. The best evidence we have is that's what was here in 1491. Not a big, dark, extensive forest. So here, with these native grasses, they're not just native to Kansas, y'all. They are native to Greene County, Tennessee. Anybody here from North Carolina? Good. I never liked them people anyway. How about Kentucky? Kentucky's wonderful. I love Kentucky people. Uh, th these were native to Kentucky. Daniel Boone hunting buffalo. He was hunting a mountain blue, blue stem prairie. Okay? So we're going to put that in these two forages right here. So that's our first factor in the study. Diverse native versus baseline introduced simply, okay? Uh, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to look at three stocking treatments. Now, I'm at a regenerative ag summit, so everybody here loves continuous grazing. Am I correct? 
I mean, where are the rotten tomatoes, Russ? I thought I was going to get run out of here when I said that. So that's our control, continuous grazing. We're going to open the gate. We're going to stick the animals in there. We'll come back and get them at the end of the grazing season. Real simple. As redneck as it gets, okay? So then we're going to have some, some more uh, regenerative type approaches where we look at high stock densities, long rest periods, short grazing intervals. Because if you have a high stocking density, you have to have a short grazing period, and you not necessarily, but generally will have to have a longer rest interval, right? And so right now what we're specking is 60,000 and 120,000 pounds per acre, okay? So that's what we're gonna go in there with. Those are sort of our more of our regenerative grazing treatments. There's a lot of folks out there that really are promoting the idea that really high stocking densities are key to healthy grasslands. Well, there's not a whole lot of data out there in the literature so that's part of why we want to do this. We want to see what those gains look like or don't look like. And none of this is prejudged, by the way. I like my native grasses, but you know what? At the end of the day, it may not pan out. And if it doesn't, I want the data. I don't want my opinion, right? And so finally, the other thing we're going to do, and a lot of us in the grazing world feel really strongly about this, is grazing intensity may have more to do with driving the train than any of that other stuff I just showed you. So what I mean by grazing intensity, just to put it in the simplest possible terms, is your residual the day you come out of the pasture, okay? So Forbes had a slide up there about overgrazing. He showed you those roots of those plants, the ones that have been heavily uh, defoliated, that had the tiny roots, and he had the ones that were lightly defoliated that had massive roots, okay? Overgrazing does more damage than almost any other thing to our pastures because it does the damage to the roots, and therefore we don't have drought resilience, therefore we don't have soil carbon, therefore we don't have soil biological activity, the list goes on and on, right? And so we're gonna impose two levels of grazing intensity within this as well, where we're gonna kinda of take it down to a lower reasonable threshold, not into the dirt, because we know what's gonna happen then, and a higher reasonable threshold. So a little bit of a light touch, a little bit of a heavy touch. and. Uh, Okay, so we're going to do all these treatments, but the important thing, going back to the stacking idea, is we're going to measure the heck out of this system. So we're going to measure cattle movement. So there's a study that was done out in Nebraska with really high stocking densities. They put uh, GPS trackers in the cattle's ears to see how much they moved. And shockingly, when they got up to 220,000 pounds of uh, cattle per acre, the cattle were really agitated, did a lot of moving, and there's other data that's coming out that shows, you know, there's an upper limit to how much you squish these animals together, right? So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at um, freaking Forbes Walker. The boy is trouble. He almost got me to say methane. Have you, Scottish people, what can you do with them, right? Methane, dang it, Forbes, methane. Uh, so we're going to measure methane, and, and we got these really cool state-of-the-art systems out there that we trick that cow sticking her head in there, and we can measure methane in the context of all kinds of environmental conditions. Because, again, you saw one of the first slides that Forbes showed you is, oh, my gosh, our cattle are killing us all because they belch. Well, we, we want to go ahead and measure that. Um, and grazing days, right? I mean, that is a key to a productive pasture is you've got to get grazing days per acre. I mean, that, that, is, that is a gold standard. But we're also going to look at our forage. Uh, so are we killing our stand? Are we wiping it out? Uh, what kind of composition do we have, desirable, undesirable? What kind of forage mass are we producing? And what is the nutritive value of the forages that we're producing, right? We, we need to know all that. And so we're going to measure all of those things. Not going to stop there. One of the things that a lot of the ecologists, grassland ecologists out in the Great Plains are all jacked up about is annual net primary productivity. And you know what? I think they're on to something. I think that's an important thing to track. So if you want to know your grazing days per acre, your carrying capacity, it's really going to be driven by this right here. How many pounds of forage per square foot, per yard, per acre, whatever, however you want to measure it, how much is that ground producing? And is it changing over time? And is it changing in the context of these treatments? Litter loads, SOC, aggregate stability, soil biological activity. And here's the fun stuff, and, and these are friends of Forbes, that these kind of people, I don't even know what they're talking about most of the time. They're going to actually put out these uh, ED covariance flux towers to figure out CO2 fluxes. So that's part of understanding the dynamics of carbon in these stands. And they're also going to put out these elaborate machines that can measure Forbes is to the nearest, you know, part per billion or something of N2O. It's just incredibly small amounts, 
But again, as Forbes has pointed out to you, thought to be a huge problem in the climate arena. So those systems are gonna be deployed out there and we're gonna try and measure the N2O coming out of these different treatments. Because we need to know the soil picture but we also need to know the profitability picture, we need to know the grass vigor picture, and we need to know the greenhouse gas footprint. So, uh, Russ, we were sitting around a table a few years ago, and Russ seems like a pretty good guy to me, and he said, we need to do some studies on this. And I said, well, Russ, just give me a million bucks. I still had not seen the chest, Russ. I'm still waiting. But it turns out me and Forbes and some of our colleagues were able to con USDA, and by the way, I should mention Tennessee Department of Agriculture is a major investor in what we're doing here. They have given us the money. I'm still would be happy to have that million bucks, Russ. Yeah, that's true. You have contributed. Everybody in this room's contributed. Uh, but anyway, so we, we want to study this because what we want to do is be able to go back to that marketplace and say that if a farmer does this practice this way or that practice this way, they're gonna have this much carbon they can sell you. Or in the supply chain side of this, so you go to a Tyson, they're making these claims, Forbes talked about it. We're gonna be net zero in such and such a year. One of the ways they're gonna to have to do that is have what I will call green steers showing up at the farm gate. And their investors, the people who are looking over their shoulder are not gonna be satisfied for Tyson Foods just to simply state our steers are green. Are they? What makes you say that? Well, we feel like they're green. We want them to be green. We hope they're green. Great. Uh, I hope I'm losing weight, but until I step on the scale, we really don't know, do we? Right? You might be able to look at me and say, dude, you're getting fatter by the day. But if I step on that scale, you know, every day, once a week, we can say, gee whiz, Kaiser, you're losing weight. Your, your blood sugar is going down, right? We can document it to where there's certainty in the marketplace. And you and I may not care about certainty in the marketplace, but where you will begin to care is if there is a premium in the marketplace that says, if you have this much carbon, or you have these net zero steers at the farm gate, getting on the trailer, that's where you get your premium. Anybody here ever heard of ESG? Some of you. Uh, environmental, social, and governance. So the big companies are all signing on to this, right? And so they're, they're trying to demonstrate that they're doing all this happy stuff. Uh, one scenario besides a marketplace premium that I've heard some people at very, very high levels in USDA and corporate America talk about, and even on the international stage, international leaders, is not a premium, but another alternative. You are fenced out of the marketplace if you can't check the boxes. And so part of the reason I want to see our project succeed, whatever happens to future marketplaces, I want our farmers, our beef cattle producers, to have the ability to access the markets or take advantage of premiums in the markets. I don't want our people fenced out. You know, most of our fescue belt farms are small beef cattle operations. Many of them have been in the family for a few generations. I want to see those farms stay farms. I want to see those farmers succeed. I want to see those farmers profitable. And I want to see them being excellent grass managers because when they are, everything else good falls in place. Good grass management. Greg, I'm kind of waiting for an amen from you, buddy. Come on, work with me here, right? You know, this is all Greg's been talking about for 40 years, right? Be a good grass manager. So. There's that summary, 290,000 fescue belt beef operations. At the end of the day, what really matters is excellent grass stewardship. Everything else falls in place behind that, right? And that's what the game we're playing and what we're up to. Uh, I like my native grasses. That's a uh, switchgrass pasture. The heat index that day on July 18th was well over 100 degrees. That's 3 p.m. Y'all tell me what those animals are doing, including an awful lot of them that are black hided. That is the correct answer. They are not in a pond. Hey, uh, so we're probably, ah, look at this. We're actually on time, Forbes. Ain't we something? Can I ask Forbes to come back up here? I don't know. Are you still mic'd? Maybe. Uh, questions for, for any, anything, any lie that either one of us have told you? Yes, yes Greg. I, I've got a comment.
Yeah, so uh, I don't know if the recording's picking him up or if it matters, but, but in any case, the question is, will we go backwards or is five years long enough? Uh, possibly and no. <laughs> so we may go backwards, particularly if we convert existing fescue pastures to native grass pastures when we, we kill out that sod. We, we're going to surely lose ground, uh, number one. Number two, uh, five years is, is absolutely too short. So one, one hope would be that somebody somewhere would create the opportunity for this to go perhaps another five years, right? And one other thing, Greg, that we're going to try to do to address that, at least for some of these practices, is we're going to actually try to create a chrono sequence, right? So yes, we're going to use these 100 farms, but we're going to save some of that 50,000 carbon sample to go out and assess uh, maybe some existing silvopasture, some existing, where did you go, native grasses, right, that have been there for some period of time so that we can extend our frame of inference. In other words, we're going to cheat. <laughs> Another, yes, sir, Russ. Not to start a controversy, but climate change is a fact. Climate change is not what the government is hyping it. How do you guys deal with that at the university level when every governmental agency is saying, oh, we want you to show the big impact of climate change. And if you uh, go to do a grant today, all you gotta do is put climate change in it and you can get a grant. How do you, how are you addressing that? Well, I, Forbes, I'll let you jump in with me, but we had a meeting on this project the other day and somebody asked me a somewhat similar question. And my answer is I'm gonna to be totally agnostic, right? I don't care whether the climate is changing or not. I mean, I may care personally, but professionally, I really don't care. I don't care how the government defines it. I don't care how they don't define it. I don't care whether they got it right or wrong. What I care about, what drives this project is excellent grassland stewardship. And at the end of the day, if we can do that, whatever's going on with the climate can take care of itself. We'll either contribute to it or not make an impact on it, but I think we'll make an impact on the quality of management on our farms. So thoughts on that? So in terms of um, climate change and climate science, I always say I'm a soil scientist. I'm not a climate scientist. Uh, as a soil scientist, I talk to climate scientists. I assume that they have got the data and that they have interpreted it the correct way. And so what they're telling me is, is what I'm understanding is going on. And uh, yeah, climate change has always been happening. Um, I've done enough, I travel around the world enough to know that things are changing. Uh, at this meeting we had in Spring Hill, uh, one of our colleagues from uh, Purdue was, he said, he uses the term weird weather. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're seeing more and more of this weird weather. And there's lots and lots of these, uh, uh, you know, data points out there to show, yes, we're seeing more intensive rain events. We're seeing more dry periods. We're seeing more wildfires. We're seeing more this and that. So yes, I, I mean, I believe it is. I mean, it is, in my mind, it is happening. It's, it's uh, irrefutable. Uh, you just look at the, the CO2 levels that are, uh, you know, rising. And we've known this for 100, 150 years, that increased CO2 two levels in the atmosphere do change uh, but the, the level of temperatures. Forbes, at the end of the day, if I go to a given farm in a given state in our project, and that farmer adopts some improved grassland management practices, to me it matters not whether he thinks you know, we'll be dead in three years like Greta Thunberg, or whether he thinks it's all a great big government conspiracy and a hoax. That doesn't matter. What I need that person to do is implement high quality grassland stewardship. Yeah. The, the, the other thing, I've, before this I was working in, in water quality and one of the things that we did, we never put on water quality things. We would, you know, we put on field days where we talk about droughts or we talk about floods. We're not going to be having climate change field days. We're going to be having, this is how, you know, when you have a drought, this is the kind of practices that we want to see. When we do have a uh, high intensive rainfall event, these are some of the data. If you had a field like this, this is some of the, the, the work there. So yes, we're not asking people to believe in climate change. I personally do, um, but uh, everyone else is, you know, but many of the practices that we're promoting are practices that, oh, they improve productivity, they improve profitability, they improve biodiversity, they improve ecosystem. It's, and by the way, they also are good for climate and the climate change. Oh, another question? Yes, sir. Are your treatments set in stone, or can you no. answer those? No, we're, in fact, uh, I'm going to be meeting with uh, 
you, you probably know Monty Roquette down in Texas A&M. He and I yeah. are going to be talking next week. I've talked to uh, different ones in, in the grazing world. And so uh, that, what is set in stone, Alan, is that half of our pastures are uh, native grass and half aren't. But beyond that, and I would love to have a conversation with you if you want to make some suggestions because uh, we can measure the heck out of it, but if our treatments aren't appropriate, then what is the frame of inference, right? And so th there may be some logistic constraints about how far we can go, but uh, I'll, I'll be more than happy to have that discussion with you. I would, I would like to yeah, do that. I, I would love to see a, uh, uh, an adaptive grazing treatment in there. Uh, you know, the, the treatments that y'all that put up are, are all static. Yeah, a factorial yeah. design, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they're, so by nature, that's going to make them prescriptive, you know, uh, because you're Some static level. at 60, yeah. you're static at 120, you know, that type of thing. So I would really, and, and I'm saying this because of the, the experience on thousands of farms uh, and knowing what happens when it's static versus adaptive. Mm -hmm. they're, they're two totally, totally different outcomes and scenarios. So it would be wonderful, wonderful if an adaptive grazing treatment could be added to this as another component. So I, I would love to chat with y'all. Yeah, let's, let's plan yeah, on doing absolutely. that. That'd be great. I'd welcome that very much. Thanks. Yep, yep. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you for your taxpayer dollars and we'll spend them wisely. <laughs> thank you.